You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. All right, what we're checking out today is an article from GeekWire. I know you guys aren't really probably huge GeekWire consumers, but the reason we are is the title is Balancing Act, What Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin's Short Tenure, One Term, Decided Not to Go for Re-Election, What Her Short Tenure Says About Running a Tech Hub. Seattle's a tech hub. Mayor Durkin came in, she campaigned for going to make this work with big business. Not only did she alienate big business, she also alienated basically the constituents that brought her in, made this just a really difficult scene. Nobody ended up liking her difficult position to be in, difficult job. And then she had the whole chop slash jazz thing this summer. And I think things just went wildly sideways. And she was like, yep, nope. She says that you know, she would have had to campaign the whole year to basically have a chance at getting reelected. And she chose just to spend the next year, 2021, doing her thing, nose to the grindstone, doing her job, getting stuff done for the city of Seattle. All right. But let's take a look and see what it is, the opposing factors. We got the big business versus the citizens of Seattle that obviously elected her that are very Democrat oriented and very progressive. Those two opposing factors those are what you find in a tech hub like Seattle. And you're finding in other places too as well. Just the, the opposing political forces. If you're new here, my name's Sean Reynolds. I'm the owner of Summit Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Klein Appraisal. But all you care about is the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. And that's what we're doing. So GeekWire, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin sought to build a bridge between the tech industry and its harshest critics in the divided city during her first term. In a one-week tech blitz last year, Durkin paid visits to Amazon, Expedia, and Apple's downtown campuses to celebrate the rapid growth of the tech sector. She also invited top tech companies to build municipal products and advise the city. We were all in it together. We were just going to have this beautiful experience, not unlike the summer of love, didn't end up that way. But Durkin, who announced last week that she will not seek a second term, made new friends, made, made, <laughs> didn't make any new friends, made few friends in her attempts to balance Seattle's competing ideological branches. And man, do we have them here? It is really weird. It's really wild. You're like, ah, got that going on? Huh, got that going on? Just a lot of commotion, a lot of mix up, a lot of people with very, very different thinking. Seattle business community threw its influence and financial weight behind Durkin during her candidacy, helping her sort of victory in 2017 with 56% of the vote. Despite that support, Durkin did not emerge as the business-friendly ally at City Hall that many had expected. Some community leaders told GeekWire in interviews for this story. So he's not business friendly. Uh oh. But others said that she did her best to create a welcoming environment for business in the face of difficult obstacles. She had too many people, too many interests drawing in too many different directions. Seattle is an incredibly complex city, even though everybody just wants to say, ah, it's just a bunch of soy drinking, you know, progressive liberals that don't know what they're doing. You got some big tech stuff going on here, too. I mean, you got some of the biggest companies in the world. Some of them have been started here. Microsoft. We all forget about Microsoft, don't we? Ah, it's in Redmond. It's not really Seattle. Oh, it's Seattle. It has influenced Seattle beyond, beyond what I think anybody ever probably gives credit to. But it's one of that's like a, you know, a grandfather who used to be in his 50s. He used to be a real doing whatever that was super important in society. And then as grandpa gets older, as Microsoft gets older, it kind of becomes less and less, becomes less of a progressive thing, but it's still there. That's what Microsoft is. It's just down the road from me here. All right, Seattle's progressive wing is more dubious. Activists and labor leaders have long viewed Durkin as too cozy with big business. She can't win. They criticize her for failing to provide a stronger check on the influence wielded by Seattle's booming technology industry. The reality is likely somewhere in the middle. But her attempt to thread the needle between Seattle's competing forces, Durkin ended up with critics across the ideological spectrum. Nobody likes her. Kind of like Mayor Ted in Portland. But that guy is truly, ah, uh, 
he just makes stuff up. And uh, we're going to do the, Oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go do Oh, that doesn't work out. Oh, what are we doing? Balancing the goals of progressives who gravitate toward booming cities and the businesses that make them prosperous is a tall order. Agreed. But Seattle is so liberal that it's just, it's, it's just polar opposites. Mayor that and big and big business, just wildly different polar opposites. Mayor Durkin made a real effort to harness the tech industry to help government, said Heather Redman, co-founder of Seattle venture capital firm Flying Fish Partners, which I've heard of, um, who is engaged in civil and uh, civic and policy sectors. However, given the political climate, I don't think that she felt she could robustly partner with any aspect of the business community, especially tech, and still work with the city council who is doing their best to run big tech out of Seattle. That's what we got going on. That head tax from two years ago, what a disaster. The jumpstart tax that we've got going on right now that basically just taxes Amazon and another 400 businesses, I think it is, who have heavy payrolls. They pay a lot of people a lot of money because that's what it takes to get that kind of talent into their systems. Oh, yeah, you got those employees? We're going to tax you. We've got a budget shortfall this year. We're going to tax you. Pandemic hit us and we don't really manage our money very well. We're going to tax you. What, you're leaving Seattle? I don't get it. I don't understand. Back to the article. Though she made no mention of her of tech in her departure announcement, Durkin's decision not to seek a second term after initially signaling she would run for re-election shows just how difficult it has become to run a big tech hub. That's the spin of this story. She had some pretty nasty things happen to her during CHOP, too. I mean, literally, the protesters did a protest to her house. And she's a former um, federal prosecutor. Put away some bad dudes. She's supposed to have a little bit of anonymity. And that didn't happen. And that didn't happen because one of our Seattle City Council members did the, walked the protesters to her house. And that Seattle City Council member is in a recall process that will hit the Washington State Supreme Court, I think, January 8th, January 4th, something like that. The drama continues. It's a story that continues to play out in Seattle, San Francisco, New York, and other cities where the vast majority of residents vote blue, but divisions still dominate the political landscape. The divide separates business-friendly moderates who fear world-class tech hubs could lose their edge if policy swings too far left. Well, that's a reality, isn't it? But somehow we're making that go here in Seattle. All right, you're wildly left. Okay, but you got a really good labor pool. We'll come to Seattle. I mean, you just see that over and over and over. But guess where a lot of people are going? They call it Seattle, like we call this the Seattle Real Estate Podcast, but I'm really from Bellevue, and I'm podcasting from Bellevue. And guess what? When you see a lot of the, this company has moved to Seattle, they're really moving to suburban cities like Bellevue, just outside, but kind of part of the greater metropo Metroplex area, the greater Seattle-Tacoma area. That's what's going on. So nobody's moving to Seattle proper. They're making, a, they're making a wild run to get out of Seattle. The divide separates business-friendly moderates who fear world-class tech hubs could lose their edge. Policy swings too far left and liberal progressives would like the cities to become test beds for social justice causes. Saw that this summer in CHOP, right? Slash Chaz, formerly known as Chaz. Social justice causes, because that's what we're doing. Taxing the tax industry. Durkin's tenure is bookended by the contentious debate over taxing big business. Like I said, the head tax and the more recent jumpstart tax, including large tech employers. Her first months in office were bogged down by the city council's head tax on Seattle's top grossing businesses, which was immediately rejected. Durkin, who did not respond to our request for an interview for this story, initially signed off on the tax after city council unanimously approved the legislation. A few weeks later, the council and mayor repealed the controversial tax when faced with a protracted battle with Amazon. In other words, we're going to tie you up. We're going to tie you up in court, whatever it takes. It's not going to be good. We've got the resources to probably tie you up forever. All right, other employees in Seattle's business-friendly wing 
it, those are all people that uh, city of Seattle was going to be facing in court with that type of um, tax going through. The head tax ordeal soured many Seattleites on new business taxes. It was two years before the city council took up the issue again, just recently. But this summer, the city passed a new payroll tax on top salaries at Seattle companies with annual payroll expenses of $7 million or higher. The tax is expected to generate $200 million annually to fund relief for families during the pandemic and alleviate Seattle's homelessness crisis because they can't figure it out on their own. Let's tax big business. They're doing really well. They should, they should somehow be required to pay for this. Not the actual citizens, just big business. Durkin opposed the tax. Oh, I wonder why, because big business would leave, uh, which is not good for the city. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. Could that possibly be? Yes. Durkin opposed the tax and did not sign the legislation, but it became law by a supermajority vote of the council. Last week, the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce filed a lawsuit challenging the new tax. What? Oh, no. Chamber of Commerce going after the city? City Council? Did a podcast on that. You can check that out if you want to. It's kind of old news now, but yeah, a lawsuit. Durkin, to a degree, got trapped between the interests of the Amazon leadership and the interest of Amazon employees, said former Mayor Mike McGinn. All right, so we're setting it up as the um, Amazon leadership and then the worker bees of Amazon. I don't think that is necessarily the case. I don't think so. I don't think the worker bees are in line with the super progressive leftist policies in Seattle. I don't see that as a real thing. They don't care. They might talk about it. Most of the Amazon folks I've seen, especially younger generation, they're not. They're, they're just doing their own thing. They don't really care about all this stuff. We care because we know what the implications are to society. That's why you're tuning into the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. And if you're a younger person, thanks for being here. And if you're an older person, thanks for being here as well. All right. So Mayor Mike McGinn said, ah, it's the Amazon leadership and the Amazon employees. It's what it comes down to. Kind of. Probably not. Leadership obviously had very strong opinions about taxes in Seattle because that determines whether they can stay in business or not in Seattle, which is the ultimate goal of a business, to stay in business. Spent so much money in the Seattle last Seattle Council cycle. Um, this is... Um, I'll read that again. The leadership obviously had very strong opinions about taxes in Seattle. They spent so much money in the last city council cycle, but a lot of the employees and the young people that come to work at Amazon, they have an interest in a different type of city than the interests of their bosses. Maybe. A friend to labor or business? Question mark. Unlike the business taxes that the city council championed, Durkin's administration was the driving force behind an effort to establish labor standards for gig workers. A lot of gig workers in Seattle. Those are people that aren't necessarily employees. They're independent contractors. They come on for a gig. They come on for a project. They come on to write code for something specific. They're in and out. They're a gig worker. They have no basic protection as an independent contractor. And they're helping shuttle people around as Uber drivers or delivering groceries for Instacart. These are the gig workers. Durkin spearheaded legislation to establish a minimum wage for Uber and Lyft drivers and tax companies that operate transportation networks in the city. The fair share program had support from Seattle labor unions. Durkin also pushed through a cap on the fees that services such as Uber Eats charge restaurants in an effort to mitigate the financial hardship the food industry faces during the pandemic. How about we reopen the food industry and that will mitigate the impact of being closed? I don't know. Does that seem reasonable to you? feels reasonable to me, but I like going out to restaurants too. But I also have friends who own restaurants. And guess what? I would like for the restaurant industry to not be shut down any longer over what is a complete lack of data and science. It's just, ah, we think they should be shut down there before they are. Enough is enough. Despite those programs, Seattle's progressive wing largely views Durkin as a centrist ally to big business. Nobody can really figure out her angle. I don't think she could figure out her angle, Mayor Durkin. There's so many opposing things, and I'm not making excuses for her, but you put yourself in the position of, all right, you got to keep these people happy. You got to keep these people happy. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not keeping anybody happy, and that's what happened.
that's what happened. So good luck to whoever is next because you are going to get teed off on by everybody anyway. So I hope you have thick skin whoever the next mayor of Seattle is, because that is a hotbed you are stepping into. The gig worker legislation aside considers whether or not there were any real material gains for working people over the last three years, or whether or not we continue to backslide into making Seattle a more exclusive cost prohibitive city, said Sean Scott. He's a social justice activist and former Seattle City Council candidate. Didn't make it. So he was a city council candidate, loser, and maybe that's a good thing because most of the other people on the city of Seattle council, they are not in a category I would define as winners, but that's just my politics. Durkin attempted to build a bridge between City Hall and the tech industry in the wake of the head tax ordeal. In 2018, she created the city's first innovative advisory council, tapping companies such as Amazon, Zillow, and Expedia to build technology products to solve municipal challenges. A year, and now we're just taxing big business. Screw it. Let's not do any of those programs. Just tax them. We're going to create some income. We're going to create some money. That's what we're doing. But she did oppose that. But city Seattle Council just said, ah, no, this is what we're doing. A year later, the city unveiled seven projects built by the IIEC, which is the Innovative Advisory Council, including a house affordability portal, homeless service technologies, and an early earthquake warning system. Well, that's important when you live on a major fault line like Seattle. The IAC received criticism from progressives who questioned Durkin's decision to give the tech industry special access to city officials, but Durkin's team defunded the IAC as a, a defendant, sorry, didn't defund, defended the IAC as an innovative way to t leverage the tech talent in Seattle to improve government processes. A mayor needs to work with lots of different stakeholders, so we appreciate that she has been intentional about including business in that, said Alicia Teal, a spokesperson for the Seattle Chamber. A few weeks after launching IAC, some of the biggest tech companies in Seattle launched a new group called C.City to connect their employees with civic life. Durkin spoke at the launch event. Durkin also asked the Washington Technology Industry Association to help recruit a new chief technology officer for the city, according to Washington Technology Industry Association Mike, CEO Michael Schutzler. Durkin ultimately selected Saad Bashir, a former chief information officer for the city of Ottawa, to run the city's IT department. Schutzler said that he was impressed with the process, thanks to the first time the city asked industry representatives for help to hire a tech leader. But Schultzler wished uh, Durkin had been more actively engaged in making tech more inclusive through in initiatives such as Apprenti, the Washington Tech Industry, uh, whatever that is, Tech Apprenticeship Program. So we got a lot of different interests that are going in different directions. Nobody's happy. The biggest missed opportunity, in my view, is the city never engaged in workforce development, he said. We've had great partnerships in other cities across the country, but her staff was never willing to explore how we set up something in Seattle to help women and people of color get access to tech jobs through apprenticeships. Uh, tech hub turmoil. That is the next one here. Shortly after Durkin became the first openly les lesbian woman to lead Seattle, San Francisco elected London Breed as the first black woman mayor of its city. The two share more in common than trailblazing. After Amazon faced off with the city of Seattle council over the head tax, San Francisco progressives sought a different approach to taxing the, the giant tech companies that have transformed their city. They put a new revenue tax on companies with more than 50 million in gross annual receipts to the voters with a 2018 ballot measure called Proposition C. Those of you in Cali, yep, you know that one, specifically San Francisco. Much like Dirk and Breed opposed the plan and like Seattle's head tax, a wonky local proposal attracted national attention when the tech industry got involved. Salesforce CEO Mark Benoif was a vocal supporter of Proposition C and had a public debate online with Square and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey over his op opposition to the proposal. Dorsey said that he supported Breed's alternative approach to addressing San Francisco's homelessness crisis. What? There's one of those in San Francisco also? And they both, both cities have progressive leadership? Hmm. 
Interesting. But unlike the head tax, Proposition C became law, and a court victory in September will free up the funds raised through the tax for homelessness services going through with it. Both Breed and Durkin are viewed as centrist-leaning politicians in one-party cities. Both have held the executive office while their cities experimented with novel business taxes designed to capture some of the wealth generated by tech. Seattle and San Francisco are home to some of the largest and most powerful technology companies in the world. And both cities are grappling with deep inequity and challenges associated with their tech booms. We see that in real estate every single day. There's certain areas that are that have just been gobbled up by a certain segment of the population making a certain amount of money. And then you've got the entire communities of these kinds of people because there's so many people working in tech in Seattle now. It's kind of amazing to see. It's like, yeah, this is really... It's really stratified. So some people work and live here. Some people work and live here. It's pretty wild to watch, especially I've been here all my life in Seattle. I've lived in a few other places, but not for very long, a couple of months at a shot um, to not really living. Um, but I have lived in Seattle and I have lived in Bellevue. I've lived in Bothell up north. I've lived in Medina where Bill Gates is. I've lived on Hunts Point, which is right next to Medina. Talk about a wealthy community that was over the top. Um, but a lot of this has to do with we've got the haves and we've got the have-nots. When you try and make everybody happy, guess what? You are going to not please anybody. So you just got to go with where your instincts are, blaze that trail. Wouldn't want to be that guy or gal, though, next mayor. But Durkin has fielded more, fielded more staunch opposition from her critics in recent months than Breed has. The anti-Durkin camp went as far as launching... A recall campaign had that happen until the Washington State Supreme Court tossed it out, no questions asked. They just, yeah, this doesn't meet any of the legal criteria. Nope, you're done. Support for the two mayors diverged during the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer. Durkin took heat for her police department's use of force against protesters. While Breed gained support across the ideological spectrum for a proposal to reinvest funding from police to the black community. In New York, the nation's other major tech hub, the comparison is complicated by factors unique to the metropolis. Metropolis, the metropolitan area. Tech is one of the major industries in New York where managing the coronavirus crisis has eclipsed most other issues over the past year. But in a parallel to Durkin's tenure, the business community has criticized Mayor uh, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio for failing to form more meaningful partnerships with the private sector. That guy, from what I can tell, is a moron. That is putting it simply, right? Just he does a lot of stuff that's like, what? What are you doing? Taken together, it's clear that running a booming progressive tech hub is a difficult job in which allies are tough to keep. Don't have any. Cities like San Seattle, San Francisco, and New York have become testing grounds for some of the most progressive economic and social policies, let's not forget social policies, in the nation. At the same time, the prosperity of those cities hinges on the success of their top employees and employers, many of which could suffer under policies designed to balance the scales of economic justice. And those companies will leave, and they are in the process of leaving, because you don't have to go very far and guess what? You are outside of city boundaries. That's what we're doing. Especially when you got a big lake separating Seattle from what's called the east side where Bellevue is. Go across a bridge, you're in a whole other world. You're in a whole other stratosphere. That's where Amazon's coming, right? Amazon, welcome to Bellevue. Redmond, the Seattle venture capitalist, said it was sad that Durkin couldn't both partner with the local business community and also work with the council. It's sad because the only way forward in our region is together. Government, business, education, activists all working together with some raised voices at times to solve the region's problems and provide an equitable future for all. That sounds like Narnia. That does not sound like reality. That sound, and if you don't know Nar Nar Narnia, you got the big lion Aslan and everything is just amazing and cool and just, you know, dialed in. It's Shangri-La, but that's not Seattle. Instead, you've got people screaming at each other, defund the police, all kinds of stuff, tax Amazon. Hey, we're out of here. 
we're leaving Seattle. A lot of that going on. The challenges are like uh, likely to become even more acute as the long term consequences of 2020s telecommuting experiment plays out. Just recorded a podcast on that this morning with the CEO of Google saying, you know, we're not going to do the telecommuting from home forever. We're going to do it up to September of 2021. And then after that, we'd like you to be closer to the office so you can commute into the office at least three days a week. And you're going to see more and more and more and more of that. And I'll cover that for you right here in the Seattle Real Estate Podcast if you want me to. If you don't, eh, don't watch it. That kind of tells me. All right, they're not watching that. Guess, guess I'm not going to cover that anymore. Guess that's not important. Many companies have signaled that they will move or dramatically reduce their presence in expensive tech cities now that they've adjusted to remote work. Okay, but that is a narrative that isn't lasting very long. Second quarter 2021, mark my words, based on the data and the science. No, I'm just guessing. I think that's when things kind of go, ah, we need to go back to the office. We'll have the... Um, Coronavirus vaccine will be in play. People will feel more comfortable. Restaurants will be open. We'll actually be able to go to a restaurant in downtown. That would be awesome because that's what you do. Without those areas in downtown, you don't want to go there because there's nothing to do. Ah, you stare up at a big skyscraper. That's no fun. The forecast for urban cores such as downtown Seattle is particularly grim. It already, it, it is grim, isn't it? It's grim. But don't count it out. The neighborhood has been rolled by COVID-related business closures, incidents of violence, and property damage over the past year, causing concern for employers. Let it be known the property damage was done by the peaceful protesters, and that is across the United States to the tune of over $2 billion. With a B, not an M, not a T for thousand. B with a billion, two billion. This is, a, this is the complex and dynamic situation that Seattle's next mayor will inherit. And perhaps it's one reason Durkin chose not to sign up for the job. I think she's got, this is totally my opinion here. I think she's got a gig set up and I think it's a good one. I think it's probably a moneymaker because you don't, you don't tap out that quickly unless you've got something else going on. We'll see. We'll see. I've been not a... There's been many things I've been critical of Mayor Durkin of. But then again, I'm a resident of Bellevue. I shouldn't even be allowed to talk on the subject, but I am because you guys listen. So we're just going to keep doing this for a while till you guys get bored and think, ah, that guy was a, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. We're not going to tune into him anymore. But Mayor Durkin was in between a rock and a really hard place. There was no winning this game. There was, there was no winning. Because if she did what, what I want, what you want, to see happen, her constituents would just basically say, mm, yeah, no, no. But the flip side is, is that you've got big business that's got one foot out the door. And when they find their spot to relocate to Seattle, not so good, not looking so good. But again, we already just said prospects are grim for downtown. So thank you so much for being here. Once again, my name's Sean Reynolds. I'm the owner of Summit Properties Northwest Reynolds Decline Appraisal. But if you guys have heard that too many times, let me know. But I'm here doing stories. We'll talk. Catch up with you guys in the next one. Bye for now. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.